This is Robug 2 from the Portsmouth Polytechnic. It has four legs, it looks a bit like an insect. It can climb up a vertical wall, as you see, because it's got sucker legs. And it's fairly clever about what it does if it finds an obstacle. I'm going to try and tease it in a minute. I'm going to try and put my hand under its back leg and see what it does. Now watch it. It's trying to find another place to put its leg there. Okay. Okay, it's trying to kick me out of the way. Right, there we are. Robots like this, in fact, direct descendants of this robot, are actually very useful because there are some places where humans dare not go, like radioactive places, nuclear power stations. And robots like this are actually in use to go into nuclear power stations because they don't mind the radioactivity and do repairs that humans would never dare to do. Now, this robot has four brains, there, 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 and there, but each one of those brains is controlling just the one leg. So it's doing a fairly low-level operation, like working out what to do if I put my hand under the, the foot. That controls the tactics of the individual legs. But the strategy of the whole robot is at present being controlled by a human outside through this cable. This is the real robot. The imaginary robot that we've been trying to talk about would do something other than that. And I'll go on talking about it when it stops, because it's now just reached the top, and I hate to think what would happen if it went on any higher. So, thank you very much, Robug2 and the Portsmouth Polytechnic. <laughs> well, Robug is a real robot, and it has been controlled by a human with a computer outside but we were using it to stand in for our imaginary robot. And our imaginary robot would have its own onboard computer running a master program. And that master program would be the, the self-copying program. It would say, make a duplicate copy, not only of the program, but also of the apparatus necessary to duplicate the program. And it would do that by walking around the world and it would have on its back the equivalent of the industrial robot with the hand and the eye that we saw in the film. So it would march around the world, picking up the bits that it needs in order to make a copy of itself. The master program would say, make a copy of the robot itself and feed the same total self-copying program into the onboard computer. A self-duplicating robot, like we've been imagining, has never yet been built. It was discussed as an important theoretical possibility by John von Neumann, who could be called the father of the modern computer. But it has never been built. But wait a minute, what am I talking about? What on earth do I, do I think this is? Or this? Or indeed me, or any of us? These creatures, walking around the world, see whether we can make this one walk. There we are. Now think of that stick insect as just the same as the robot we've just been imagining, not the one we've just been seeing, but the one we've just been imagining, with its own onboard computer, carrying around the instruction, walk around the world, pick up raw materials, eat plant material, use that plant material to make new robots just like this one. And then those ones will go out into the world and they will wander around picking up food and they will be making new stick insects just like this one. And in every case, the object of the exercise is to pass on the program that does the instructing. Chameleon is the same, we are the same, an elephant is the same. This is fundamentally what a human or an elephant is. An elephant is a huge digression in a computer program written in DNA language. Our DNA builds its own self-copying machinery. This is what we are. We are machines built by DNA whose purpose is to make more copies of the same DNA. 
Well, that process is all very well once it starts, but how did it start originally? To answer that, we have to go back a very long way, very long time, more than 3,000 million years, perhaps as much as 4,000 million years. In those days, the world was very different. There was no life, no biology, only physics and chemistry. Some people think that life began in what's been called the primeval soup, a weak broth of simple organic chemicals in the sea. Nobody knows how it happened, but somehow, without violating the laws of physics and chemistry, a molecule arose that just happened to have the property of self-copying. And after that, Darwinian evolution and life took off. Now that may seem a bit of a stroke of luck, but it only had to happen once. What's more, it may have happened on only one planet out of a billion billion planets in the universe. So the sort of lucky event we're talking about as happening on this Earth could be so rare that the chances of its happening in any one year somewhere in the universe were only one in a billion billion billion. That was enough luck for it to have happened. Of course, if it did happen on only one planet anywhere in the universe, that planet has to be our planet because here we are talking about it. But I think probably uh, the origin of life was a much more probable event than that, and therefore there probably is life on lots of planets around the universe. It's even been suggested that the origin of life may have been a rare event, but having started on one planet, it then spread to other planets in a process called panspermia by the Swedish chemist Arrhenius. And this is a fanciful reconstruction of panspermia by Carl Sims using the supercomputer, the connection machine. He doesn't really believe in panspermia, but it's a, it's a nicer animation anyway. Here is a spore arriving from another planet on some distant world. The spore swells and bursts, and its genetic material, its equivalent of DNA, is raining down on the planet. And now each one of these units is going to start sprouting a, what we shall call, plant, for want of a better word. These plants, by the way, Carl Sims didn't invent, he evolved them in his computer by a process very similar, though more elaborate, to the biomorph program that some of you may have seen in an earlier lecture. So on this planet, different kinds of plant are growing up, they're going through their growth cycle, and at the end of the growth cycle, they're going to reproduce again, and the whole cycle of growth and reproduction is going to be renewed. Here's a forest of plants, all waiting to reproduce. And here's the reproduction. They're going to be shot out into space, spores going off. There it goes. There they go. And the cycle is renewed. And the genetic information is sent off into distant space to recolonize other worlds. Well, that was, of course, pure fantasy. But it does make some serious points uh, about life anywhere in the universe. Uh, there will always be, I think, some kind of recurring life cycle which begins from information capsules of some sort going through a phase or phases of growth and elaboration and then finally returning again to the original uh, information capsule phase. 